Well, inspiration comes from everywhere. And as we talked about one of our previous podcasts, inspiration can help us in the creation of something amazing. That comes true when it comes to the vehicles of the Cars movie. Every single vehicle in that movie, inclusive of Lightning McQueen, was inspired by a real road-going vehicle. Not a lot of them were new and cool designs all of their own, where most vehicles in there were based off of actual vehicles from the road. And today, Autolux is going to take a look at some of the most amazing vehicles to ever grace the screens of the Cars movie and where they actually come from. So sit back, grab some popcorn, and listen up to the Autolux podcast as we bring you the Cars of Cars. Welcome back to the Autolux Podcast. I am your host, as always, the, the doctor to the automotive industry, Mr. Everett J, coming to you from my host website at autolux.net. If you haven't been there, stop by, check it out, read some of the re- reviews, check out some of the ratings, and find some of the greatest car companies from around the globe, big or small. We have them all on the Corporate Links website page, all from the autolux.net website. The Autolux Podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by podbeam.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email over at email at autolux. So like we said in the beginning, cars of cars. We can all tell that every vehicle within cars franchise originally comes from somewhere. And some of these cars are actually variations of a multitude of different vehicles, which is kind of funny because some of them seem more like an original product. But, in all reality, they're not. Essentially, take a look at Lightning McQueen. Everybody's like, oh, well, eh, Lightning McQueen isn't an actual vehicle. He's all actual created vehicle for the Cars movie. It's an original inspiration. I call BS on that one because his inspiration comes from a multitude of different vehicles. Standard stock car outlines really make up Lightning McQueen, where if you really want to go back to it, the Ford Tauruses of the late 90s and even the Dodge intrepid stock car of the late 1990s early 2000s helped to create lightning mcqueen add in a little touch of a toyota supra and a mazda rx7 and you have the makings of one of the most influential sports cars on the market mr lightning mcqueen yes his inspiration does come from a multitude of different vehicles similar to that of mater mater was originally a 1951 international harvester but he was also a mine tow truck mixed in add in some key features from the old DeSoto and you have the makings of Mater he's another variation product there are a few within the movie and a lot of the newer vehicles that you see within the movies so like the ones that aren't older like Doc Hudson come from actual inspiration Well, the lost couple that shows up in the town is essentially just a minivan but a gelatinous blob of a minivan huh Well, I can only think one minivan that would suit that category. Hello, the most famous minivan of all, the Dodge Caravan. Yeah, Dodge was an inspiration for the standard minivan in the car's product lineup. Now, as you all know, some of these vehicles are a lot easier to find out. Sally, we can all tell, is a Porsche. Like, come on, Sally Carrera. She even looks like a Porsche Carrera. To be exact, a 2000 Porsche Carrera. Michael Schumacher shows up at the end of the first movie, and Michael Schumacher plays the part of a 2007 Ferrari F430. Yeah, pretty interesting from himself. A lot of the other cast you can see were coming from real vehicles. Doc Hudson was 1951 Hudson Hornet. Luigi, a 59 Fiat 500. Ramon, one of the most famous ones, a 1964 Chevrolet Impala Coupe. The parts from a 59 as well. Tell the King, which is kind of funny because the King was actually created from his own self. See, when the Cars franchise decided to get some of these race car drivers in it, they decided to use their most famous vehicles to showcase them in the movie. Nigel Mansell was famous for Aston Martin, hence Nigel Gearsley as an Aston Martin DB9. Mario Andretti got his start in stock car racing with a 1967 Ford Fairlane playing Mario Andretti when he shows up in the Cars movie. Lewis Hamilton, at that point in time, was racing for McLaren Mercedes, and he is a 2011 McLaren MP412C. 
where Jeff Gordon was famous for being a race car driver for Chevrolet. And his Chevrolet inspiration was a 2006 Corvette Z06. Naturally, it's got to be a performance product for one of the most coveted stock car drivers of all time, Mr. Jeff Gordon. Or in that case, Mr. Jeff Gorvette. But the most famous of all was the king. The king, not only voiced by the king, played the king as the king's most famous vehicle. A 1970 Plymouth Superbird. Richard Petty, whose most famous stock car of all time, was a Superbird. And number 43 used again on his car in the movie. And his likeness was modeled after the Superbird that he was famous for. So not only did the king voice his own car of his own car, of the iteration of his own car, he was that car. So every variation of Richard Petty was utilized to create the king. Even the car colors. Dynaco took its colors from Richard Petty. Richard Petty was never sponsored by a company called Dynaco, but he did have the blue and white on his original 43 Richard Petty Plymouth Superbird. After that, he went to the red, white, and blue, more of the red and blue concept from STP. But before those days, he was known as the king of stock car racing in his blue and white Plymouth Superbird. Uh, Well, if you've watched the original movie, Lightning McQueen's sponsors are actually two Dodges, which is kind of interesting. You could take a look at them and you're like, oh, what are they? They look so familiar, but they weren't super big vehicles. That's because Rusty is a 63 Dodge Dart. Well, the Dart was a famous vehicle, but in history, more people remember from the 60s, Dodge Chargers and even Valiants and Barracudas. They don't remember the Darts. They remember the Dart Swingers near the end of the 60s when they got into muscle cars. But in 63, the Dart was just a small, tiny little car. Dusty, his brother, is a 64 Dodge A100. He's a Dodge cab over van. And cab over vans were huge in the 60s, with Chevrolet having their Corvair models and Ford having the original Econoline lines. Now, the original Little Red Express was a Dodge A100 van, a cab over pickup variation of the A100 vans. And that's what Dusty was modeled after. The reason why they did that is because there were non famous vehicles, but there were also vehicles prone to rusting. Yeah, you didn't catch that one, did you? Vehicles from back in those times, especially the Dodge Dart and A100s, were very prone to rusting. So why not create something to keep them from rusting? Rusties was born of the concept of rustable vehicles. Chrysler Corporation had a lot of issues with rusting problems. Well, a lot of car companies did back in those days, but a lot of Dodges in the early 60s had those issues. So by making them both Dodges, made it kind of funny that they needed Rusties bumper ointment to save their bumpers from rusting. <laughs> uh, it's a great thing, and it's real funny. Well, we watch Lightning get loaded up into his vehicle, and a lot of the other stock car drivers come out. Chick Hicks, who's actually based off of a four variation product from General Motors, he's based off of the 83 Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme, which also had the Pontiac Grand Prix, the Buick Grand National, and the Chevy Monte Carlos, all built off the exact same platform. But Chick Hicks was more of the standard product. Gotta remember, the Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme is actually one of the most stolen vehicles for a short amount of time in the 1990s, because a lot of people love that body style, and the Oldsmobile is very similar to the Buick. The Buick Grand National and GNX were a sought-after vehicle, and the Oldsmobiles were the closest variation of it. The Grand Prix and the Monte Carlos completely looked different, but the Cutlass Supreme was bland, boring, but could easily be given off as a Buick. It had a bit of its ego to itself, where Oldsmobile was moving into more of the premium marketplace. That is why Chick Hicks kind of gets his ego from. He gets the ego from that Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme because a lot of people that drove those cars, even when they first came out, were more of the egocentric vehicles of that point in time. Not seeing these things? Hell, Daryl Waltrip plays Daryl Cartrip, a 1978 Chevrolet Monte Carlo, one of the first stock cars he drove in history. Kind of funny that the car they model him after is the car he first drove. Next to this was Brett Mustangberger, a 1964 Ford Mustang. Hell, you can't just call him Mustangberger and have a name close to Mustangberger without throwing in a Mustang. 
But as he gets loaded up, he sees some of the other stock cars around. And some of the other stock cars, especially the Dynaco one, look a lot like the Chevrolet Monte Carlos of that point in time in stock car racing. Very familiar designs. All stock cars, apparently, in the mid to early 2000s were all built off the exact same shell. It was only the stickers on top of it that made them different in the engines underneath. Everything else was all the same basic shell. But the basic shell was more modeled after the Monte Carlos of that point in time, where later it would start to take on more of an image of the Dodge Intrepids with squared off images. When he leaves the town, he gets put into Mac, a 1985 Mac Superliner pick transport truck. He eventually see a, a Freightliner Argosy later on. He says, I ain't a Mac, I'm a Peterbilt. Yeah, Peterbilt, Argosy. There's another one for yours. But the four vehicles that make Mac fall asleep, DJ is modeled after one of those famous box vehicles or toaster cars of the 2000 era, the Scion XB, famous for being DJ-inspired aftermarket tuner vehicle. He's closely followed up by Boost, who's modeled after a Toyota Supra, and Wingo, who's modeled after a Mitsubishi Eclipse. Next to that, they also have the Snot Rod, which is the Dodge Challenger. Now, why did they create Snot Rod, a big vehicle that sneezes a lot, as a Dodge Challenger? The funny thing about that is, a Snot Rod actually was built like a lot of muscle cars during that point in time, where you actually had your engine blowing out of the hood, and you wanted your air intake popped out. This is before the days of big, large exhaust. So you put your blower right out of the top of the hood. Well, Challengers were famous for doing that. Hell, they had the Shaker hoods as part of their main production lineup. So by making his Snot Rod a Challenger made him more of a muscle car and a recognizable muscle car to have a blower out of the top. Boost is the Supra just made perfect sense because Supras were a standard gelatinous blob shape. But when you add aftermarket features to them, they were an amazing looking product like Boost. And being a Japanese tuner car, just made it more worthwhile. Each vehicle was modeled after the biggest part of the automotive industry that those vehicles took on. DJ was utilized as DJ aftermarket vehicles. Boost was utilized as an aftermarket tuner. And Challengers were utilized as massive Mustangs. The reason why Wingo has a massive wing in the back is I don't know how many Mitsubishi Eclipses I've ever seen in my life that have huge rice rocket wings on the back of it. Yeah, rice, rice, baby. You find a lot of them with these massive wings on the back of them. And that is why he was modeled after that. One of the weirdest things is after he gets off the highway, when he gets pulled over by Sheriff. Now, Sheriff is a 49 Mercury 8. This was not a car that was very famous with being a police cruiser at all. But why did they make him Sheriff? Well, the funniest thing is, is when you look at the front of an actual Mercury 8 from 1949, the grill on the car actually looks like a mustache. So when they were trying to choose a vehicle to model a Sheriff after, and Sheriffs are always famous for having a mustache, mustache they needed a car that somewhat had a mustache it's like if they needed a, a sexy exotic dancer or something they'd probably use a lamborghini mira because of the eyelashes around the headlights think about it cars have their own personality and that old mercury even though it was never used as a police car and barely anyone ever saw them as police cars its mustache grill just made it perfect to become sheriff in the movie now francisco Benulli, we all know in number two was modeled after not only just a formula one race car but Michael Schumacher's Formula One race car. Come on, it's Italian. He's not Italian, but he raced for the Italians. So naturally, Bernoulli is Ferrari. Got a bit of an ego behind him, kind of like Ferrari. But getting back into the characters from there, Sarge and Fillmore, great characters and great vehicles to be used as models for those characters. Sarge, a 1942 Willys Jeep. When you think Sarge, you think of a sergeant, you think of army. And when you think of the army, you think of two things. You think of one, a Hummer H1, or two, a Jeep. Now, if you're talking about somebody who's been there for a long period of time, it's got to be the Jeep. Why? Because the Hummer is more inclusive of being something from today. And to have something more from that generation, you have to get a more inline hippie who lives next door. One of the biggest vehicles known as hippie automobiles would be a Volkswagen microbus, or as another term for it, the hippie bus. So Fillmore naturally had to be made after a Volkswagen microbus. 
Yes. Now, Sally is a lawyer for a Porsche. You, you have to remember a lot of lawyers and a lot of higher end business people, especially people that just get out of college or university and get into these bigger roles, tend to go out and buy a Porsche as their main vehicle over anything else. So making Sally one was more in line with what actual people and consumers are known to have jobs as for the purchase of those automobiles. Yeah, they didn't play dumb when they started picking out their characters. Look at the number two, Finn McMissile is based off an Aston Martin DB5. Doesn't look exactly like it, but you can tell that he's supposed to be modeled after a DB5. It's kind of interesting. Now, moving back into the town, we get Luigi and Guido, both Italian-sounding names, but unfortunately not both Italian vehicles. Luigi is a 59 Fiat 500, but Guido is actually a forklift merged with the BMW Isetta. That's not even Italian. Why did they think to do this for Luigi? Well, they needed a forklift, and there's no big makes out there except for Toyota that are forklifts. So unless you're going to make them, not to sound racist, but if you're not going to make the forklift Asian, they wanted Luigi and Guido because they wanted the leaning tower. The reason why they used it is because the Isetta was penned in Italy. It wasn't penned in Germany. It was an Italian design and it had an Italian appeal to it. So utilizing it for an Italian inspired character is where Guido came from. Red, naturally, is a Pierce Arrow fire truck. Okay, one of the most common fire trucks you could find out there. And Doc? Well, we've already talked about Doc. He's the fabulous Hudson Hornet. He is one of the only vehicles in the first movie that actually utilizes a real car company's name. You've got to remember a lot of the other one. Daryl Car Trip, Mustang Burger, Jeff Corvette. They all have variations of those names. But Doc actually has the car company in his name. Reason for this is that Hudson no longer exists. So they're able to utilize the exact design of this car along with the actual name of it. It's easier to get the rights for it than it is for an existing car company. Now, Michael Schumacher and Ferrari, the only reason why they got that one is because... Well, Ferrari wanted to self-promote itself in the movie. Now, if you're going to put Michael Schumacher in there, you might as well make him a Ferrari because he races for them, right? The most fun one that I found while doing research for all the different characters in the original Scars movie was Flo. Flo is actually a concept car from Cadillac. She showcases the original Motorama that General Motors started and helped create the auto shows in the American circuit. She's an original Motorama show car. And she was modeled after those show cars of the 1950s that people saw go across the country to help draw new buyers and inspire a generation for new vehicles of the future. So when you want to do this, you want to do it right. She's going to be the woman that, that escapes being a concept and wants to be reality. And she's the epitome of the 1950s, along with her supposed husband, Ramon, and Impala Coupe. One of the cars most synonymous with lowrider culture, voiced by none other than Cheech Moranis. Cheech, a guy who helped build the lowrider marketplace in the world through Cheech and Chong, and we've already covered in our Cheech and Chong and the lowrider culture podcast. Not only does his voice fit with the car, the car fits with the voice. The last character in the original series that just fits with the whole story was Lizzie. Lizzie was modeled after the original Tin Lizzie, a 1923 Ford Model T Coupe. And the reason why she has the name Lizzie is because we called them the Tin Lizzie. Lizzie got her name from what we called the vehicle. And she was modeled after a vehicle that helped build the automobile industry. You can't have a car movie without having a Model T in it. Especially if it's an American movie, you have to showcase the original start. And they did that. And they did that with all of the different cars. Moving into the second movie, we start seeing some more cars. And some more car companies. Like Miles Axelrod. We all know he's supposed to be a Land Rover Defender. And if you don't know, the original Land Rover Defenders were not the greatest vehicles out there. Sure, they were built off a Jeep platform, but a lot of their parts did not match and fit up well with the original Jeep counterpart vehicles, which means the original Defender series, or the Series 1s, had major issues, which made Miles Axelrod as one that's a constantly breaking down a perfect example of the original Lemon, similar to that of Graham, who is a 72 AMC Graham 
gremlin, and an Acer, who's a 75 AMC Pacer. They all had to be modeled after cars that were true lemons in their respect. David Hobscott is a 61 Jaguar E-Type. We get Raul Carl, who raced a Citroen C3 rally car from France. Mrs. the King was a great one. A 1974 Chrysler Imperial Town and Country station wagon. A luxury station wagon. One of the only big luxury station wagons from the 1970s. Pinned up with one of the greatest luxury coupes of all time. The 74 Cadillac Coupe de Ville of Tex. Like, if you're going to have a character and you're going to call him Tex, you got to make him one of the most famous Texas-inspired big sedans out there. It's got to be a Cadillac Coupe de Ville, and it's got to have the horns on the hood, because that is how you got to roll. But yeah, in the second movie, we get a whole bunch of, of new characters and new cars. The third one really didn't get into a lot of the old classic cars. You get Smokey as an old Studebaker pickup truck and a couple of the classic cars. But besides that, a lot of them are just inspiration vehicles borrowing heavily from other vehicles. Cruz Ramirez kind of blends lines of the brand new GT86s with an LFA and even an Acura NSX. And one of the fast cars of today. Number two kind of showcased a few more other vehicles. With the Queen being a Rolls Royce, something we automatically assume with the Queen. Uncle Topolino is a Fiat Topolino. Now, come on, there are a lot of great cars that inspired all kinds of great vehicles in the series. But utilizing other people's vehicles to help build some of these created some of the better ones. Jackson Storm is inspired by brand new hypercars of today. He's a variation of a multitude of different ones. From the LFA, the Scion, the Gardo, hell, even the LaFerrari all get blended in to be Jackson Storm. It inspires us and it brings us to look for inspiration in the, in the world. There are a multitude of different vehicles utilized to create all the different variations of cars within the Cars movie, with Lightning McQueen and Mater actually being a variation of a multitude of vehicles. Lots of others you can see as being true vehicles in the real world. But why do they have the mix? Well, it gets hard drawing a lot of different cars from around the world, and you have to pay rights to get all of those cars. Some of them will allow you to do it, and some of them won't. But in the end, it all helps inspire us and show us the world around us. It makes those cars more noticeable in the real world. How many kids see a 2000 and Porsche Carrera and say, hey, there's Sally. And one of my favorite ones was the spy in the second one, Rod Torque, okay? A crossover between a Mustang and a Camaro. You see either one of those in the real life, you think it's Rod Torque. You see an Impala, you think it's Ramon. You see a Fiat 500, you think it's Luigi. You start giving these cars their own personalities and names. Cars help showcase real cars in the real world to a new generation of people. And that was a great thing about it. It utilized aspects from those vehicles' history and key features from them to build these characters for the movie. There's a lot of good character cars out there in the real world. Volkswagen Beetles are used for bugs. But why wasn't the Mira used for, you know, a sexy female? There are all kinds of other cars out there that have personalities. And if they ever do a fourth movie, maybe they should have a Juke playing Gators. A Geely Panda actually being a panda bear. Let's bring to life some more vehicles and showcase more of the automotive world within the world of the Cars movie chain. The cars of Cars. There's a lot of great ones that are showcased within the movie and a lot of those cars have a story behind them about why those specific ones were chosen. Like you really think Mario Andretti should be an actual indie car, right? Open wheels and all that. But no, he started in a Ford Fairlane. They give you the cars that were most famous with those people in their history or where they got their starts or maybe they rusted too much. Or maybe its name could be utilized for the name of a character. There's all a special meaning behind the choices and why we see those specific cars in the Cars movie. So what other cars did you notice in the Cars movie? Let us know in the comments below. So if you like this podcast, please like, share, or comment about it on any major social feeds or streaming sites from around the globe. Big or small, we have them all, and we are on all of them from around the globe. From Spotify to iTunes to Amazon Music and even iHeartRadio, the Autolux podcast can be found on any major streaming site or social feed that you are a part of. 
So send us a comment. Click the like button to learn more from the Autolux podcast and Autolux.net website. As we do send out a newsletter whenever we get enough. As you can learn more information by signing up for our newsletter from the Autolux.net podcast. So after that, stop by the website, read some of the reviews, check out some of the ratings, go to the Corporate Links website page, find these car companies from around the globe. Big or small, we have them all on the Autolux.net website. The Autolux podcast is brought to you by Ecom Entertainment Group and distributed by Podbeam.com. If you'd like to get in touch with us, send us an email over at email at Autolux.net. So, if you like this podcast, please like, share, or comment about it and send us a feed down at the bottom. Click the like button. We'll send you over some information. So, for myself, Everett J, the Autolux team here, and Ecom Entertainment Group, strap yourself in for this one fun wild ride with the Autolux.net website and podcast. And the cars of cars will take us on.